You're listening to Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast, presented by Brandon Elliott. This show will be going over all aspects of real estate investing and is intended to educate, motivate, and prepare you to take action on your first or next real estate investment. For more information, please visit BrandonElliottInvestments.com. Thank you for listening and enjoy. Welcome back, everyone, and welcome to Ready, Set, Go, a real estate investing podcast. All the new listeners out there, what is up? I'm excited that you guys are tuning in with us. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you get the newest notification every single Monday. Leave a review. Let us know how you guys are feeling. We have a special guest today, and I'm just pumped. It's awesome. This guy is a beast. He's in California as well. Really, just the last couple of years has been, he set up success with his lead gen, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. He's got an awesome wholesaling business going on. He really started off with the fix and flip. So we're going to be talking about that, dealing with contractors. You know, we've all had those struggles. And then now he's jumping into more of the Airbnb side a little bit and getting more creative with that, just extra income coming in. But the burst strategy and getting long-term rentals, I think we're at 70 something at this point for- Yeah, 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 that's right, man. Yeah. Very excited. But without further ado, Jason, what is up, my friend? How you doing, bro? What's up, brother? Thank you for having me on. I appreciate you letting me hop on this podcast with you. Uh, I want to make sure I add some value and share with your community, man. So I'm looking forward to today. Dude, it's a blessing. I, I appreciate it. The privilege is all mine. Uh, I wanted to just, anybody out there that doesn't know exactly about your story, who you are, where you're from, do you mind just diving in a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah. I'll try to give you the condensed version. Sure. I got started in real estate uh, at the end of 2014, beginning of 15. Prior to that, I had worked in corporate America, just corporate jobs. I worked for two large companies. The first one was a technology retailer and I was doing sales and sales management for them for seven or eight years. And then I transitioned to another company, also in sales and sales management. And I found myself after about 15 years in corporate America, just being really burned out, man. I was not liking what I was doing. I wasn't happy. That was projecting into my personal life, into my marriage, into my relationships with my kids. And I could see the people that I work with and you can almost see your future, man. You know what I mean? And I, I knew that, you know, just looking around, I was like, you know what, this isn't for me. And I had always been interested and drawn to real estate. Even when I was younger, I read like Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was like 19 or 20. I'd always been interested and intrigued by the idea of real estate investing. But I think like most people, especially as you get older and you have kids and you have all the responsibilities that come along with that, you get complacent and you get scared to take a chance and really bet on yourself. And that was definitely where I was at. And so I had reached this transitionary point in my life where I felt if I don't make a decision now, I probably am never going to do it, you know, and uh, I sat down and I talked with my wife and we basically, you know, she gave me her blessing and we basically set things up in a way where we could live off of her income for a year. She was a high school counselor and still is right now. And, you know, I had an opportunity to just dive in full time into real estate. And and that's what I did, man. I started the self-education process towards the end of 2014. And I really just learned by, you know, listening to podcasts like this yeah. and going on YouTube and just taking a lot of action and figuring it out as I went along, yeah. man. And I think that for me was the best way. You know, you just fail and forward and pick yourself up when you fall down and you just learn from your mistakes and you just keep moving and keep moving. And and that was it. We started our first project in March of 15 and, and haven't looked back. I love it, man. I didn't realize we actually started right around the same time. Back in 2012, I, I was working for a, a real estate company, but 2015 is where we actually like picked up our first one and it just started snowballing. So yeah. it's really, it's exciting to see your success and what you've built up so far. So why real estate for you though? Like anybody in your life, somebody? Like no, you, I have, it's, it's really one of the things that I, I always try to impress upon the people that I talk to is I had no real estate background. I had no yeah. construction background. I didn't come from money. I didn't really have very much money, honestly, when I was getting into it. I think As a kid, I was always interested in wealth accumulation for whatever reason or another. I was always interested in that type of thing. And I saw real estate as a vehicle that just made sense to me, right? Like I was never really into the stock market. I've got some small holdings in the stock market, but the bulk of my portfolio is real estate based. And for whatever reason, it just made sense. And even today, that's what I like about it. It's not what I say is it's a simple process. It's not easy, but it is very simple. If you can understand simple math and you can understand basically how to value properties and then subtract all your costs and your profit margin. It's pretty simple to come up with, you know, where you need to be at offer wise. And, you know, that for me played into my strengths because I didn't want something that was too advanced. And also I think 
my sales background and just me in general, I have very good communication skills. I'd always been good at working with people in my sales job and in my management positions. You know, that type of stuff came easy to me. And so once I learned like how a real estate transaction worked, all of my old experience in my sales jobs kind of kicked in. And I was like, man, I've been doing this for 15 years. We're just talking about a different type of product or service, right? And so I just had to get comfortable with that. And then as soon as I did, I was off to the races. Love it. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people out there just overcomplicate it, right? And I'm sure you find that a lot. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a very simple process. You just have to simplify it and break it down. It is. Yeah. And I think it can be intimidating because you see yeah. people like us that are active or you see the stuff on sure. TV and you see these things and, you know, we're talking about a lot of money and it is, it's a competitive industry. And, yep. you know, there's a lot of people with big egos here. So it's something where as a newcomer, and I went through this too, it's like, geez, man, I don't know if I'm cut out to do this, man, especially when yep. you're struggling at the beginning. Right. And so I think you've got to simplify things. You can't get shiny object syndrome in this business. You can't jump around from one strategy to another strategy. You've got to pick something, get laser focused, and then just get ready and, and bear down for the long haul. It doesn't have to take forever, but it's going to take a little while, especially at the beginning to get some traction and, and get some momentum and get going in the right direction. I love it. I couldn't agree more. So basically how you started off, you got some education and then you just you know, I do want to talk about your first deal, what that looked like, but yeah. just to give some inspiration to some people out there of what you build up in such a short time frame. what are some of the numbers like that you guys are doing now? How many deals are you guys usually seeing per month? And where is like a majority of uh, your stuff going? I know previously We're, it was on like the fix and flips, but now it's more on wholesaling and still holding, you know? That's yeah. What about. The way my operation looks now, it's me. I've got a full-time project manager, we've got a full-time in-house assistant, and then we've got a full-time virtual assistant. So I try to keep a lean operation, just, just three. three people. I yeah. love it. Wow. Yeah, man. And so we're doing, I would say five to six deals a month. So our target is about 60 total projects for this year. That's about what we can handle with the team and the operation that I have. You know, I fell into a trap about a year or two ago of like wanting to really scale and go big and build out a big team and a sales team. And I just realized as I started doing that, I felt the same way that I felt when I was back in corporate America, right? There was a lot of meetings. There was a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching. There was a lot of time that you have to invest in order to build a team like that and build an operation where you're doing 100, 150, 200 deals a year. And I just realized that that wasn't for me. I really like my time freedom. I really value the time that I get to spend with my wife and my kids and my family. We love to travel and all these other things. And so I wanted to build a business that supports that type of lifestyle versus trying to build somebody else's business or what their idea of like the perfect business model is. Right. And so right now we're flip heavy right now because of what the market's doing. You know what I mean? Sure. The market is so hot. You know, I felt like we're still oh, actively dude, you, wholesaling. You, you can like stuff. flip a property. You can just put it on the market trash and still get more than what you would have with all the yeah, time. It, you know? It's never been an easier time. I feel like yeah. to make money right now. And so I feel like it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. You know, I've got six years of experience, so I'm not the most experienced guy, but I've got enough to know that it's not always going to be like this right now. Yes. But yeah. I do feel like we've got some runway left and we have this window of opportunity where you know, we should focus on making as much money as we can before there is some type of shift in the market. And then we're going to have to change what our exit strategy is. But right now, I'd say we're probably 70% flip. We are still actively buying, but we're being very strategic about what we're buying and holding. And then the rest that comes in is wholesaling. So we get to a point where operationally, you know, we can handle 17, 18, 19 projects at one time, active current projects that we have on our books. And we're at about that threshold right now. So everything else that comes in above and beyond that threshold, then we look to wholesale it or Just do some type it. of joint venture partnership where we're not stressing our operation. So yeah, that's pretty much what we're doing right now, man. I love it. Is the goal in the future to slowly start trying to scale back up with hiring on more people to potentially add on more or are you have I to I think so. I think it just kind of depends. Everybody's journey is different. And that's one thing that I've learned, I think, is you can't try to like replicate what somebody else is doing. You know what I yeah. mean? Because you never really know what's going on behind the scenes. And Powerful. you've got to get very clear about what makes you happy as a business owner and just as an individual, right? And if your business doesn't serve those things, then I think you're out of alignment and you're constantly going to be in this issue of like, yes, we're doing great. We're making money you know, everybody's like, Oh, my God, dude, you've got this killer business. But deep yeah. down, it's like, you're not really happy. You know what I mean? And so 
I ended up having to kind of take a little bit of a step back and retool the operation to kind of get it geared more towards like what I know makes me happy. Yeah. And then once we get everything dialed and optimized, which we're pretty close, then we could potentially bring on one or two more people and maybe a virtual role where yeah. we can work from anywhere. And that's really what I want to do. I don't necessarily want to be confined to an office. I don't want to be confined to a desk. I came from that corporate background. So part of me, I think, had this limiting belief where it's like, we all got to be here. We all have to be oh, okay. next to each other working. And now you're I definitely think trying value. to get out of it, right? Yeah, yeah, I think there's a value in that. But COVID showed me that, you know, like we don't necessarily need to be in all in one place, right? And we can work yeah. when we want, how we want. And so, you know, I think it's it's a constant refining process that we all go through as business owners to try to get our business dialed in. I love that, man. That's so, so good. So let's talk about your first deal for a second. Like, what did that look like? Do you remember it? Do you still have I remember, it? Uh, dude, yeah. I remember it, man. Yeah, I, I'll tell you. So so when I first got into the business, I see this out of a lot of newer investors. I fall into the trap of like reaching out to agents, going to like realtor.com and like just looking at the cheapest houses and trying to make the numbers work, right? And trying to yeah. find foreclosures. And I didn't know anything about foreclosures. And I spent a few months spinning my wheels doing that. And I was just like, man, this isn't working. And the first deal... I give credit to my wife because she was the one that really planted the seed with me. She said, Hey, you know what? She goes, my brother, my brother-in-law, her brother, she's like, yeah. he's got this house. She's having issues with his tenant. I know he wants to sell the property or he's thinking about selling. Why don't we just partner with him on that house and see how that goes? And the house is kind of like a fixer upper, but he had owned it forever. So he had a bunch of equity in it. And I just yeah. basically reached out to him and I said, Hey, listen, man, like your sister and I are going to do this. I've got the money to help with the rehab cost and covering everything. You put up the house. Let's just partner on it and see what happens. And that's what we did. And that one was, I always call it with training wheels because the hard part we had already had figured out, we had already had the house. Right. Yeah. And so we found a contractor that had worked with a bunch of flippers and he was helping us because we didn't know much about construction or how to manage these projects. And he was a really cool guy. He had flipped like 200 houses for another investor that I know locally who had referred him to me. And as we were getting down to the end of that project and we're getting ready to sell it, I remember, I'll never forget this. I remember standing in front of the house with them and he goes, well, what are you going to do next? And I said, I don't know, but I want to do more of this, man. And I would really like to get serious about, you know, figuring out and doing this at, uh, at scale. And he goes, well, you got to start buying these things directly from the seller. And I knew about off market yeah. properties and I was somewhat familiar with it, but for whatever reason, that conversation was what really it clicked with me and I got yeah. really serious about like, all right, we've got to start, you know, either doing direct mail or bandit signs or door knocking or, you know, whatever the things that were, were popular at those times. And that's when I really dove into that. And, you know, that's basically how we started with our direct mail marketing and our direct to seller marketing, which is what we're doing now. I love it. Yeah. Before we actually jumped on this and went live, I started recording, you know, you mentioned a lot of new people come your way and, and they just, the biggest thing that you are trying to like portray to them and let them know just being transparent is you got to get serious about your lead generation, right? Yep. So that conversation right there just clicked with you. It, it set that fire off. Let's talk about lead generation. What did that look like for you in the beginning? How did you actually start transitioning to get serious about it? So, I mean, I knew and I was familiar with how this like a, a traditional sales process worked because I had yeah. been doing that forever, right? So I think I had somewhat of an advantage coming in from somebody that didn't have a sales background that I yep. knew what marketing was. I knew when leads come in, how to get them down your sales funnel and qualify yep. them for motivation and, and kind of get them through until you can get to a point where you can convert them. And yep. so I basically said, Hey, I've got to get leads coming in. Right. And I think that's the biggest piece that most people are missing, especially at the beginning is, you know, it's so easy to jump around over to all these different things. And one day they want to learn about marketing and lead generating. And then they want to go interview contractors and they want to go talk to title companies and they want to go find hard money lenders. And what I tell them, and this is what I say to everybody is real estate investing is a linear process, meaning there's steps that you have to follow and you can't jump from one step to another. You've got to do step one first before you go to step two. And okay. step one for me in this business is marketing to and generating leads from sellers that are motivated to sell for some other reason besides money. Money yeah. can't be the big factor, right? They, there's gotta be some other, you know, some other thing that's happening that's kind of pushing them or motivating them to sell the house. And those are the people that we wanna be in front of. And we need to get our marketing set up and get as many of those leads coming in and into our sales funnel so we can start talking to them, qualifying 
them going on appointments and then ultimately making offers and getting those offers signed and, and getting escrow open. That's so good. What are the most common type of motivated sellers that actually fall within that lead funnel for you guys? So we see like the same eight to 10 circumstances over and over and over again. So yeah. if you're listening and you're just getting started and you're trying to figure out like, who do I market to and, or where do these people come from, et cetera, et cetera. It's these scenarios, right? So we so, see so people that are- write this stuff down, guys. Write it this down, write so it down. Important. Yes. So it's sellers that are inheriting unwanted property. So typically they're going through the probate process mom or dad or a friend or family member has passed away and now they've got this property that they know that they're going to inherit but you know a lot of times they need work or they're a hoarder house or it's just this complete fixer upper and they don't really want anything to do with it they don't have the time to hire a contractor and do all of these things and they just want to liquidate the property get their money and move on with their life right just so want the more. cash a lot of, a lot it, of millennials right? just want the cash keep running that's it that's it and then i think one of the biggest areas of opportunity that we're going to see especially now is landlords with problematic tenants so either going through oh, yeah. the eviction process yeah. or whatever right so so pro, uh landlords dealing with problem tenants landlords that are just downsizing and getting older and we're going to see a lot of that too with baby boomers that you know, have owned and accumulated 20, 30, 50, 100 properties, right? And now they're getting to a point where their kids are not interested in taking over and they're just wanting to liquidate and be done with them. So that's, those are two really good that's, areas, I think. That's literally how I got my first dozen properties in a small area that it was just oversaturated with several big investors had like 50 properties each. They're all in their 90s. You yep. know, it was like, it was one of those things. That's been one of the most consistent lists that we work and it's going to be consistent, I think, for the long term. And it's actually, you know, pulling an absentee owner list with high equity that, that have had ownership interest in the house for a long time is a relatively easy thing to do, like on prop stream or property radar or whatever. So that's a list yeah. that I think if you're a new investor, that's one to really target for sure. The other things that we look at are code enforcement issues. So houses that are like have physical distress, right? Like sure. they're boarded up or they've got long grass, or they've got trash everywhere, that type of stuff, right? Violation. Uh, people yep. going through financial issues, right? They're behind on their mortgage, they're behind on their taxes, they have some type of legal issue, or they're going through a divorce, that type of thing. And what I tell everybody is, believe it or not, all of these scenarios are a matter of public record, right? Yeah. Like if you, if you go down to the county courthouse, you can pull all of the eviction petitions, the unlawful detainer petitions, and if you have that information, it's got everything that you need in order to reach out to that seller. It's got the name of the owner, it's got the name of the tenant, it's got the property address, it's got all the rent information, everything that you need to do to add them to either a database or a mailing list or a cold calling or texting list. And then once you have that, then you've got to go out and engage those sellers, right? So you do the work to collect that data, then you've got to engage them somehow. And when I say engage, I mean, you either got to put a letter into their hand, right? A letter or a postcard, you're going to pick up the phone and call them or hire a cold calling service, or you're going to pick up the phone and text message them, or you can door knock them. Really, that's really like the four things really that you can do right now. And you just yeah. do that over and over and over again. And you've got to realize that sales is a numbers game and the law of averages will always play out. So if you just stick with it and you don't get too up and down, start and stop, and you just stay consistent with your marketing efforts, it's inevitable that you will eventually do a deal. I can't guarantee you the time frame. But if you just do it and you don't stop doing it, it will happen eventually. Oh, yeah, 100%. It, it's such a numbers game, right? Like the more leads you're going through, the more offers you, you got to submit offers, right? So yep. uh, submit your offers, then you're playing the numbers game, you're getting in front of enough people, then you will get a deal. So is that where you're getting your list from uh, still to this day, just the, the city? County. Yeah, it's a mix of everything. So like yeah. the probate, the eviction, the code enforcement stuff, all of those are available from the county. And there are some websites that aggregate all that data and put it together. My preference has always been to go get, to get it from the source when it's available, right? Because yeah. I feel like that's the freshest, that's the most accurate information. Yep. Um, so when we can, we like to get it from the city or county directly. But then we also use Property Radar, PropStream, all the popular websites yeah. to do like your absentee owner list and all that stuff too. So it's a combination of both of those things. And so we get the data, then we skip trace the data. And once you have your data, then you just pick which marketing channel you want to do. And we do mail, calling, and texting. Those are the three big ones for us because we've already got the list. Now let's just try every avenue that we can to try to engage the seller because some people, I would say, you know, without like stereotyping, but I feel like the profile for a lot of the older sellers that I meet, they respond well to mail because they're still going and they're still checking their mail. That's 
something yeah. that's been ingrained in them from when they were little kids and they're going to yep. check their mail for the probably for the foreseeable future you yeah. and i like if it looks like junk a mail text. it goes straight in the trash right yeah. i don't even look at it but i'll respond to a text or i'll respond to a phone call right so yep. you gotta try to engage sellers in the fashion or the way that they're most likely to respond back to you so that's what we're looking for that's good so who's managing that portion of the business of getting the leads to come in our virtual assistant, our virtual okay. assistant handles 90, 95% of it. We've got, you know, people out here that are driving for dollars. We've got local runners and assistant that goes and gets the, like the stuff from the courthouse. But then once we get it, it gets sent to our VA, our VA scrubs everything. They put it into our database. They send it to batch and then batch does all the skip tracing. That's where we house all our data is in batch leads. And then, you know, she handles all the direct mail orders. She also handles all the outbound texting. We use a cold calling service called Call Magicians, and I just pay them a monthly fee and we send the data to them. They do all of our cold calling and then any qualified leads get pushed back into our CRM. But it's really my VA. And yeah. I think most people don't understand, you know, what you can get accomplished virtually. I mean, I think I pay my VA, you know, not that much. I think it's like four or five bucks an hour. And she yeah. does an amazing job. I, she works full time for me. And not only is she doing all of the work on the front end with the data, but she's also fielding all of the leads. She's responding to all the text messages. And I only really get involved when I need to at the very end. She's very capable and can close deals on her own, but sometimes she needs help with values or sometimes we need to go in person. So then maybe I'll go or somebody on the team will go. You know what I mean? But we've got the system in a pretty good place. Yeah, that's very simplified. So yeah. once the lead comes in, she can close deals a lot herself or it gets funneled to you directly and then you close? Yeah. So I would say probably the next hire for me would be an in-person like boots yeah. on the ground acquisitions person. So I could yep. be totally detached from that acquisitions piece of it. It's hard for me because like the other areas of my business that I don't like and that I don't enjoy, those are fully delegated, right? Like we can sure. flip a yeah. house and I never have to go to that. I'm so emotionally detached from how these houses look. Like at the beginning, I used to love being at the property and love like picking out all the material. And you do a couple hundred houses and it just gets old after a while, right? So now I don't even like going to the properties. I don't like looking. The only time I really go now is more just for social media purposes, to show yeah. it on my story or to record like a before and after style video, that type of stuff. But my project manager, Morgan, she runs the whole project. You know, I'm it. not involved with anything. All the finances and the bookkeeping and the accounting and how everybody gets paid and all our bills, that's all systematized and delegated. Yeah. But for the sales piece, I'm actually really good at it and I enjoy it. Like I'm still yeah. somewhat of a deal junkie, like even now, yeah. and I still kind of get a little bit of a charge, like when we get contracts signed and we come out of appointments. So I still like doing that process. So it, even Not though old. I know I shouldn't be doing it and I shouldn't be like, it's probably not the highest and best use of my time to be going sure. on appointments anymore. You know, we haven't hired that position out yet. So that will probably be coming soon. And eventually I'll train somebody that can handle all of the, you know, face-to-face in-person acquisitions that have to happen. But a lot of the stuff we do virtually nowadays, man, like the VA is totally hundred percent capable closing virtually. We're doing marketing for basically anywhere in a two hour direction. So some of these things, we're just not going to drive out there. And that's one thing that COVID really showed me was that I always felt like we've got to be face to face with the seller. We've got to be in person, yada, yeah. yada, yada. And you just don't like, you just don't yeah. have to take it from somebody that really believed that that was the only way to do it. And we've closed so many deals over the phone or via text where we're never meeting the seller, like never talking to them. Like, you know, yeah. I wouldn't have believed that I could buy people's houses just by text messaging them and doing emails and DocuSigns, but you know, I've done it over and over and over again. So I know that it's true. And so now we just prefer to go that route if we can, unless for whatever reason, we're forced to go out there in person. Yeah, I've actually had several of my friends say exactly the same thing, that they had this belief that you had to be there in person to make the deal. And COVID has really shown a lot of us that you don't anymore. And it's yeah. really crazy to watch some of your stories that because you mentioned, you know, you can't be emotionally attached, right? Like you're not. And thank God you're not, because I think you would have gone down the deep end with a couple of the projects you got going on. What is that one? I forget his name. Larry. Uh, my buddy Larry. Larry. Yeah, yeah, dude. Yeah. Infamous, it's the funny, famous man. Larry. <laughs> yeah, dude. It's those type of houses where like you can't help but get emotionally involved because now I feel like it's a challenge. It's like Larry oh, and his yeah. buddies versus me. And it's like, you're not going to beat me, dude. So like, yeah. just to give the people a backstory, I bought this house 
and it was like a cross between like the Breaking Bad and Walking Dead over there. It's like broken down cars and RVs and these guys, I was able to get them out, but then they keep breaking back in and damaging the house. And it's kind of that whole game that you have to play when you're dealing with, uh, you know, houses with squatter issues, right? And so that type of stuff we still do. You know, I like the carpet and paint fixers a little bit better, but you know, as long as the ROI is there, we'll take on some of those ones that have some more hair on them than the normal deals. Yeah. So I know I say it with a lot more of a laughter and smile, and I'm sure there's some pain in it behind you, but at the end of the day, I know you're not emotional to it. It's it's one of those good challenges that you like to go it after. It is. It is. And it is, man. Yeah. It, it just, it's the testimony behind buying it right, because you're still going to make out on this deal as well still, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's yeah. where it's like, you learn these lessons because I've done deals like that in the past where, yes. you know, I thought that I bought them right, but then you don't yeah. really know and, and, and can account for all this crazy stuff that comes up, right? Like these guys yeah. come in and they break in and they do X amount of dollars worth of damage. You're not yeah. really calculating that if you don't know, you know? And I think that's, for me, I think like real world experience and, and learning how to not just get past those issues, but deal with like the emotional roller coaster that's involved when you're first getting in these things and learning that, hey, I have the capability to get over the hump on this. And then when you do, it's like now I have all this additional experience that comes in so valuable. It's like, hey, if I'm going to do a project that looks like this again, I've got to buy it way down here just to account oh, yeah. for all of this stuff. Right. And yeah. so, you know, you just kind of learn as you go. And that's one thing that people always reach out to me and they're like, man, dude, like you've got this crazy thing. And I just tell them like, man, a lot of this stuff, we're just figuring it out. You know what I mean? Like we don't know everything, you know what I mean? And you've just got to have faith and confidence in yourself and your ability to be able to push through any obstacle or barrier that comes up because you're going to face a lot of challenges in this business, man. Yeah. At the end of the day, you're just a problem solver, you know, and like when the problems come up, you just got to adjust and adapt quickly and try to make your best decision. You know, it's not always going to be perfect or right, but with these guys, like the damages, I saw you build a brand new, amazing fence. They went right through it and bunch of yeah they're things. like driving their car through it at night and i mean everybody knows the price of lumber is like however much it's gone <laughs> up and it's like i go there and every crazy. other week i stop by it's like a different section of the fence is missing and all this crazy stuff and so it's enough if you're brand new to send you over the deep end man because it's like why are these people do why would somebody do this you know what i yeah, mean like, why are they the going point? you know what i'm saying like yeah. why would you like why don't you just move on and it's one of those things where it's like you can't be tied to this stuff emotionally because it'll just drive you crazy. So you've got to just understand it's a business. It's just numbers. Keep an yeah. eye on your bottom line and make sure that you've got enough margin in the deal in order to account for some of this craziness that comes up when you buy a property like that. Yeah, when it comes with tenants and or yeah, anything that's crazy. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what is the goal with that project? And then any other horror stories or learning lessons along the way that you think would be valuable for the listeners? Yeah, I think the exit strategy on that is just to buy, fix, and sell it. We're almost to the almost yeah. to the finish line with the rehab, so I think we're listing cool. that one next week. But I think it's even more stressful isn't the right word, but I think you're even a little bit more anxious once the house is fixed because when it's all beat up, I don't really care if they're breaking in. Now, oh, you know, now that I put 35 grand into the house, now I'm like, you know, a slider costs $1,000 and these guys are so brazen, they'll just kick in the slider and break into the house. You know what I mean? And so every time something like that happens, it starts to ring the register, right? So you've got to be cognizant of that. Have, have um, the police stepped up and helped at all in the area? It's tough, man, because, you. you know, I'm a big supporter of law enforcement. And so, I, you know, you, I don't want to talk anybody down. Their hands are tied in a lot of these situations. Like there's so many, especially if the house is in a rougher neighborhood. Yeah. There's so many other calls that are going to be priority over that, right? Like a break-in in a vacant house, even though I would consider it important. You know what I mean? Like if there's only X amount of people available and they've got this many calls, you know, they've got to prioritize it by, you know, stuff that's life threatening. So we try to do our best and, you know, we notify Fresno PD and, and the different people and agencies that need to be notified. But again, like, you know, you're kind of left on your own. And that's what I think there's nobody's going to save you with these things, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, even though you would think that, you know, somebody would come and it's like, you've got to be prepared to go over there and deal with that. And you've got to have some really, really thick skin, especially yep. to go and approach you know, squatters like that, because you just never know how they're going to respond to stuff, you know? And so you've, you've got to be ready for it. Yeah, that's good. Any other horror stories like that or nothing or... like that? I would just say that the deals where I've lost money, right. And this is what yeah. I, this is, this is what a learning I've curve. Seen. This is yes. Good. Right. So yeah, it, one of the things that I would say is I'm skeptical of people when they've been in the business long enough where they're just like, Oh, I've never lost the money on a deal. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. like, you know, like I think 
when you do this long enough and you do it, the amount of deals that I've done, eventually you're going to have some losers in there. And the reason why you try to do volume is because you're never going to make everything that you project, especially at the beginning, especially when you're first starting, right? Because you don't really understand how to properly value these things. And so yeah. the ones where I've, lost big chunks of money. I think the biggest deal that I've lost on was either 25 or 30,000 bucks is the hit that we took after paying everybody off was that I just got overconfident. I got overconfident. I didn't stick with the things that I've learned and the principles and the foundational things that I've learned that got me into the game. And I started kind of getting away from those things. And that's where I've, I've always gotten bitten by deals that I've done that. Right. And so I think just don't get overconfident. Don't start just taking everybody's words for stuff. This deal that I'm talking about, the deal was like four and a half hours away. I never went and drove it in person. I just yeah. bought it off pictures and video. I trusted what I was hearing from my contractors and the subcontractors and different things. And just all, everything that could go wrong went wrong with that deal, right? And had I stuck with, you know, what I knew is true and not gone into a market that I was unfamiliar with and not gone to do something that, you know, I wasn't really ready to take on, I wouldn't have taken that hit in the deal, right? So just don't become overconfident, right? You've got to learn to trust your instincts and set rules and boundaries for yourself and don't go outside of those boundaries. And yeah. that's why having consistent deal flow is so important. When you don't have consistent deal flow, you start to get desperate. And then that's when you start moving the goalposts a little bit and your boundaries can get a little bit wider. And you can be like, well, you know, I know <laughs> I said I would never do this, but you know, like, I think I can make this happen to compensate for this. And you're always always, always going to get burned on deals like that. So just uh, stick to your boundaries and don't go outside the box too much and you'll be okay. Man, it resonates with me so hard just saying yeah. it because yeah. it's like, how many times do we know like the right way and just stubbornness, like is getting outside of ourselves or whatever. And, you know, I guess cocky or, or whatever it is. That's um, right. Yeah. But 160 K for me, for my learning lesson. Jeez. Yeah, dude, yeah, it is, man. But those are the things, honestly, like it's hard to stomach that at it that is. moment. But then when you look back, you're such a more well-rounded real estate professional by being able to get over a loss like that, dust 100%. yourself off, and then realize like, hey, like if I can overcome that, like what, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you can overcome pretty much anything that's going to, you know what I'm saying? So I feel yeah. like you learn from those type of things. And it's not always the money. Everybody focuses on the money, but what type of experience are you pulling out of every single one of these deals? So because cool. every deal is going to teach you something new. And yes. your job is to take that, download it into your brain, keep it there on file. So the next time you come across those things, you know how to navigate it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's one of those situations that like God was definitely preparing me for the multi-millions. So I just, you know, it's one of those things, take the learning curve and I won't make that mistake again. So it's good. That's right. Cool, man. Well, Jason, you're like just such a rock star. I appreciate you so much. Where do you truly believe like the market is heading? I know nobody's got that crystal ball, but we're in some weird times right now, right? You're getting leads that you can throw on the market all beat up and getting more than what you would have asked for, or yeah. even if it took all the time to do the remodel, right? So yeah, absolutely. Where, where do you see the market going and how are you preparing yourself? It's a really good question. And I talk to a lot of people that I, I trust and respect to try to get their opinions on it as well. What sure. my personal feeling on the market conditions that we're seeing right now, it's driven by interest rates and driven by lack of inventory, right? And so I yes. think one of those two things or both of them have to change before we're going to see any changes in the market, right? So, you know, we can talk about interest rate. I think there's been some grumblings that the Fed wants to increase the rate somewhere towards the end of the year. At least that's what I've heard. I think if you do see an uptick in rate, that means that buyers can't buy as much house as they could when the rate was lower, right? So I think yep. that would probably have a cooling effect on the market. But I think ultimately, I think in, in my market, Fresno County, we're either one month or less than one month worth of inventory, which is oh, like, yes. it's, it's yep. unseen, unseen, unheard of, right? And so even if the rates go up, you know, it doesn't really solve the bigger issue to me, which is inventory. And so we've got to get that inventory from somewhere. And I think People are speculating that it may come from foreclosures. I don't know that we're going to see this humongous wave of foreclosures. Yeah. I think people are going to either take advantage of a forbearance or a loan modification. I think there probably will be some. But when you look at how much of a housing shortage we have, even if all of the ones, all of the homeowners that were under or that were dealing with uh, 
you know, a forbearance or potential foreclosure, right? Even if all those came on the market, it wouldn't even put a dent in where we're at, right? So I, I think we are going to see some more inventory come, at least in my local market, from people now that the COVID restrictions are lightening up and the governor's opening everything and, you know, next week or whenever it is. So I feel like people will be start to feel more comfortable. But even then, we've got some runway, man. I feel like it's going to go through the end of the year for sure. And if I had to bet, it's probably going to go through 2022. How far into 2022? Who knows? I think you have to be smart. And what we do is we're tracking all of the markets and all the way down to the county and the zip code where we're actively flipping, flipping property. Sure. And we're looking at how much inventory is there. What are the days on market? What are the prices of the houses getting listed for? And then what are they ultimately selling for, right? So if yes. they're listed here, but they're selling here and the days on market are still really low, that shows me that there's still a lot of demand, right? Yeah. But as days on market start to creep up and as the sale price starts to get down back to the list price or even lower, that's an indicator to us that, you know, hey, maybe we're starting to see things cool down a little bit. So if you're being smart and what I like about real estate is that we're not going to see these crazy swings like we see in the stock market or in crypto and some of this yeah. other stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you are smart, you should be able to get out in front of a shifting market, right? And so we're just sticking with shorter term projects, things that we can get in and out of relatively quickly. And that way, if we know and we see these changes kind of coming on the horizon, we can adjust. And if we need to like be a little bit less aggressive with our list price and come in lower to ensure a fast sale, just to get that house off of our books to be in a good position for, you know, maybe something that changes here in the future. Yeah, that's good, man. I love it. I definitely believe that interest rates will probably be that ticking point, right? Of, of something starting to go up and then who knows how high they'll get, but then it could potentially turn into one of those creative type of strategies where we could more seller financing. Options. Yes, exactly. Because I think- even, just this last year, I feel like it's been more difficult with uh, entrepreneurs trying to get loans, right? It's just making it more, more yeah, documents I, you got to go through. The, what everybody needs to understand is there's, I feel like there's always going to be a way to make money regardless of what the market does. Your strategy yes. may change, but that means that you've just got to be willing to adapt and understand that what worked today may not work a year from now. I mean, I see that with what was working for me at the beginning when I first got in, that stuff doesn't work right now. You know what I'm saying? So you constantly got to be doing stuff like we're doing, networking, collaborating, sharing yeah. ideas, talking about, hey, what's working in your market, what's working in your business, and try to take that and apply that to ours, right? And so I agree. I feel like all I've ever really known is a market with an upward trajectory. I mean, if we got in in 14, 15, the market's only been going like this the whole time, right? So yeah. what I am really cognizant of is you know, just making sure that me, the people that I care about, the people that I collaborate and do business with, I just want all of us to have a seat when the music stops. You know what I'm saying? And so, <laughs> yeah. so we just have to just be smart about all this stuff and be smart about what we're doing and not overextend ourselves and over leverage ourselves, but not be afraid to get aggressive when, you know, the deal dictates it. Exactly. You know, I can't tell you how many friends of mine that are just way too conservative or just very analytical, right? That Back in 2015, 16, we're saying, hey, the market, we're at the all-time peak, you know, it's going to yeah. crash any day and maybe this year, next year. And then they've been waiting and waiting and waiting. And it's like, bro, it's not happening. It's never um, going to happen. And you can't like, this is what I tell people, like, you have to stop watching the news. You have to yes. stop reading articles on CNN because the real estate is market dependent, right? So what's happening in Fresno, California is not the same thing that's happening in San Francisco, California, right? right. So yeah. those are two markets that are on different trajectories, right? But yeah. if you read some article on whatever website, pick the website, typically yeah. it's going to be talking about national statistics, right? And so you can hear this, and it doesn't apply towards what's happening in your home market, right? So you, what I tell people all the time is you have to be very, very careful who you get advice from and who yeah, you take yeah. that advice from, right? And I would only, I would suggest you only take advice from people that are doing exactly what you want to be doing. And if your friends or your family member are trying to tell you like, oh, it's a bad time to do this, ask them to show you their real estate portfolio. Yeah, you know what I'm how saying? many deals and have you done? Them, how many deals have you done? How many rentals do you own? How many blah, blah, blah. And then- then I will be willing to listen to your advice because you're speaking from a place of certainty and you've yeah. got a track record and I, and I will trust you. But if you've never 100%. done anything, like no offense, but like, it doesn't make sense for me to listen to you about this. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So why would I, why would I do that? Yeah. With all due respect, it's just, it's exactly. It's not a, yes, it's a, all due respect, but like, yeah. I'm not going to get my advice from, you know, a friend or a family member that has no real estate experience. I'm only going to talk to people 
that I trust their opinion and I would be willing to stake like my future on that type of thing, right? I'm not going to exactly. stake it on somebody that doesn't know what they're talking about. Yeah, that's so good, man. That's so good. Yeah. Cool. Well, how can people get a hold of you? And then I want to see, you know, any final thoughts for the listeners if, if they're brand new, but uh, yeah. first and foremost, like uh, social media presence or however you, people can actually connect with you. I'm most active on Facebook and Instagram. So you, you could just put my name in Jason Pritchard on either one of the platforms and I should pop right up, you know, connect with me, follow me. I answer all of my messages and I try my best to catch up with everybody. Even if I don't get to you, you know, right away, or even that same day, I do make a point throughout the week to go back and try to respond to everybody, man. So if you've got questions about this type of stuff or whatever it is that I'm doing, I really am an open book when it comes to yeah. this. I don't believe that there's a secret. Like I was completely 100% self-taught at the beginning. There's nothing wrong with paying for coaching. There's nothing wrong with that. I do that right now in my business to shortcut the learning curve. And you've got to understand that that's what you're paying for. You're paying for like somebody else's experience and taking everything and condensing it. So you don't have to do what I did at the beginning, which was watch a million YouTube videos, listen to a million <laughs> podcasts and try to piece everything together. Again, I found success, but you know, most people don't have the persistence that I have to do it. Right. So yep. you got to pick which way you're going to go about it, but you have to just know and understand that when you're starting out, the advice that I would give is that your biggest obstacle is going to be up here. And I feel like most people want to like get the real estate stuff down, but they don't understand that, you know, that voice in their head is the thing that's probably holding them back more than anything else. And if you just stick to like the simple stuff, getting your marketing set up, getting on the phone, talking to people, going on appointments, getting those reps in every single day, you'll get the practice that you need to get good at real estate, right? What you need to spend your free time doing is not listening to another podcast, but it's how do I keep my head screwed on straight? So then that way, when I am feeling down or I'm getting in a fight with my spouse or something bad happens in my personal life, I don't get totally derailed, right? Yes. And get off track. And that's Who's why I think focused. most people struggle, right? Like yep. it's easy to be charged up after you listen to this podcast. I'm excited right now just talking about this stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So it's easy to be motivated and, and be like, yes, let's go. I'm ready to kill it. Right. But talk to me in a week after you haven't been doing anything and you know, you got yelled at at work with your boss and you're pissed off and all you want to do is sit down and watch Netflix and just hang out or watch the game. Right. Sure. Those are the moments where you've got to snap yourself out of that funk and realize like, Hey, if I want to be successful in this business, it's going to take a lot of time and energy. And we don't get paid based off of our time in this business. We get paid yeah, for producing a result. A result. Yep. And so until you can get good at producing that result over and over again, you're not going to make any money. And it took me almost a year of working <laughs> every single day before I ever made any money in real estate. And most people are not conditioned to do that. We yeah. want to get a check every two weeks because we spent eight hours working. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, just, we're conditioned that way. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. So yeah. you've you got to work on changing the way that you think and feel and start reconditioning your subconscious mind to help propel you closer towards what you want to do, not to hold you back. And I think most people struggle with that. And they've got this inner voice that's full of fear and self-doubt. And they're just too afraid to get outside of their comfort zone. And, and nothing good is going to happen when you're just comfortable and complacent. Man, man, so good. So good. I, I'm pumped up from this. I really am. Me too, man. Jason, yeah. Man, you're such a boss. I, I really do appreciate your time. I, I know you're busy and, and you got a lot of things going on, but so much motivation and just education in this one. And that's what it's all about. So I appreciate you giving the time back to me and the listeners. You just gave an hour of your time. What could myself or the listeners do to give back to you? Man, you know what I found in one of the book that I have gifted the most is something called The Go Giver. And I yeah. found where when you learn to give with no strings attached, I feel like the universe will always pay that back full circle. It's just been proven to me over and over and over yep. and over again. So I, I'm not necessarily looking for, for anything, right? I feel like just by doing stuff like this and collaborating and building a bond and, and a relationship, it, the synergy will eventually present itself. And then we'll see like what the right opportunity is for us to do something together. You know what I'm yeah. saying? But I think the first thing you need to do is surround yourself with like, like-minded people that are moving in the same direction as you. And, you know, I think eventually something will happen and a light bulb will go off where it's like, dude, like this is a great opportunity. You're great at this. I'm great at this. Let's work together and see what happens, man. So I would just say to you and to the audience and the people that tune into this, man, just, you know, get around other people that motivate you, that want you to succeed and be successful. Yes. 
and then just see what happens from there, man. Amazing things will happen when you start doing that. That type of stuff changed my life. I love it. I love it. So good. Well, you guys heard it here first on Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast. Make sure you reach out to Jason, show him some love on this one. And and like I said, he is an open book and he'll get back to you if if you guys have any questions. So if uh, we weren't able to answer it today, reach out to him, show him some love. And as always, make sure you hit that subscribe button for Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast. You get the newest notification every single Monday. Leave a review. Let us know what you guys think about it especially on this episode, it was fire. So very excited and and thankful for you, brother. If you guys need any credit repair done for you services, then reach out to us on creditrepairmobile.com. Otherwise, if you're looking to get educated on credit, be able to build up credit, six figures, even up to seven figures in funding on the business side or personal, and then be able to leverage it, be able to purchase properties like we have complete all your remodels or even do hard money lending with credit, start out Walmart automation stores with credit. That's right. I mean, the list yeah. goes on and on. Then what you want to do is check out Credit Council Elite, our mastermind group. If, if it's a good fit, then you guys are more than welcome to apply. And yeah, we will see you on the next episode next Monday. Jason, you are the man, brother. I appreciate you. I appreciate you, bro. Thanks for letting me come on and, and uh, share my journey, man. I hope it's impactful and adds value to the people that tune in. Hell yeah, man. Always. All right, guys. Till next time. Stay blessed. Thanks, guys. This has been another episode of Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast, brought to you by Brandon Elliott. For more information, please visit BrandonElliottInvestments.com. Also, please don't forget to like, share, and leave a comment below. Thanks again for joining. Until next time, God bless.